If you do what 99% of the people do, you'll never be in that 1%. If you want to be in that 1%, you kind of have to think. Sometimes take advice, fine, but think for yourself. What's going to, you know, give me the best output? Because ultimately, you know, it's the 80 20 rule, right? It's 20% of what you work on is going to give you 80% of your output. So, what are those big things that you need to work on every day mm -hmm. to get that output? And that's why I think everyone needs to come back to it every morning is just looking at what they're working on and okay, going, what is the output of this? What's it going to help? What's it going to be? How's it going to get me to my next stage? There's lots of things that you can do which seem impossible. Okay. Until you start doing it. And I think. Give me an example. Rishi, thank you very much for joining us. Not at all. It's a pleasure to be here. For those people who don't know much about your journey, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got there? I'm currently running a company called Incube Space. Uh, this is a startup which um, started a couple of years ago now in sort of uh, 2019, 2020. And we essentially do predictive HVAC optimization for large commercial buildings. Uh, what that means is that we measure how people are using a space, so how many people have gone into a room or exited, and then we'll adapt the heating, ventilation, air conditioning to be more proactive. So when loads of people go to a room, CO2 levels go up, temperature goes up, we'll counter that um, so that we're using less energy um, and making uh, buildings healthier for, for people on the planet. So. That came about from my previous businesses, you know, before that was um, running corporate innovation um, projects that we did with large corporates, uh, like Bosch, TFL, mm -hmm. um, and we had to put them in a building. Uh, they came to us and said, we don't like running these innovation uh, sort of hubs in the headquarters because it's too stuffy. They don't like doing it in a WeWork because everyone's drunk by lunchtime. And uh, so they, they said, can you design and build us some cool spaces for that to be run in? So we did that and just saw all the problems that were in in the world of commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it led onto this. Before that, we um, had a double-decker bus. So yeah. <laughs> we're... this came out on the back of a, um, one drunk a night out, is that right? It was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we actually used to run a, an event at the time where we used to interview entrepreneurs. And um, that came off the back of a, a media company, YHP. And we one night we interviewed one of the founders of One Pint Stay. And afterwards we all went for drinks, had a few too many beers, and got talking about ideas of, you know, can you use people's homes or spaces like this to rent out to freelancers or, or entrepreneurs to work in as they travel. And um, I guess that's kind of how things work these days. Yeah. And that was uh, the initial idea. Then we thought, let's do it on a bus. And then we thought, let's do it on a plane. Let's do it. <laughs> then we brought it back in. Yeah, yeah. Bit. <laughs> so yeah, we ended up buying a bus pretty much the next day. Um, but the, the next day, literally. Yeah, literally. <laughs> we, we had um, that evening, we kind of searched on Google how to buy a bus, um, went on the top thing, made an inquiry, and, and we were meeting with them the next day. So that was quite fun. And, and how long after university was this venture, Incubus? So this was 2013, 2014. Um, I left university sort of middle of 2010. So, so three years after university, I joined a startup actually called Huddle. Mm -hmm. um, watched them sort of grow from about 10 people and I joined to about 140 when I left. Um, you know, B2B SaaS company, raised 40 million, expanded across the world. It was super good experience. It really inspired me to, to kind of go do my own thing. Working in a startup and, as you mentioned, a very small employee base at the time, were you able to sort of mold your own role and get more responsibility? Yeah, massively. I'd, I'd kind of done my own businesses while at university and so... I kind of knew a little bit of that was quite cool and I really wanted to do it again yeah. at some point, but it wasn't the right time. So uh, when I came out of university, found this job, they were actually, I think it was the Startups 100 um, list they have every year. I just went through the top five on that. They were number one, got a role with them, which was fantastic. It was just sort of um, an internship for a few months and then grew into, into something else. But really, yeah, it was... It was kind of one of those roles which I grew into and 
took on more responsibility. And at that stage, you know, everyone's just coming together to help the business in any way they can. Mm-hmm. So you you end up growing quite fast in, in certain roles. And then as we raised more money and we got more people, the roles suddenly closed up again. So it became a lot more now. This is your specific area. Yeah. And everyone had their kind of specific roles. So that was a good time for me to leave. Already had sort of inklings of something I wanted to do to support entrepreneurs again. That night happened with the bus, uh, the bus idea, and we just took it from there. So yeah, a few months later, I just uh, quit. And one of my colleagues there at Huddle, uh, George Johnson, is also my co-founder. Um, so we, we, he kind of left just after me as well, and we, we went on and did that. If we were to go back a bit, and you mentioned that you also did businesses here and there even before when you were at university. Yeah. So where do you think you got the entrepreneurial bug from? It is. It's a very good question. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. My parents are, you know, my dad was in a, a job for 30 years. Um, uh, my mum wasn't entrepreneurial at that stage, let's say. Um, but I think they were both, the mindset was there if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are more entrepreneurial now. And they've, you know, my mum's become an author. My dad's gone and been doing his own thing since leaving his his company. Yeah, I think the mindset was always there to to look at opportunities in the world, to be quite positive, to be very open, and and um, they're very good with people and networking side of things as well. So I think uh, always had that, which um, opened up loads of opportunities for me because it's quite curious. I mm-hmm. think so. Yeah, when I was at university, you know, my first lectures, I was there virtually brain dead looking at the wall like this guy's reading a book book to me from the 1970s yeah. and this is not the way I learn <laughs> so um, I'm a very practical learner I like to do and figure it out and fail multiple times and but it gets me closer to to figuring it out and so um, just saw an opportunity at university when um, you know people were going to the markets or the shops to go find the coolest trainers and outdo everyone else and to be honest not a world um, world I was into or I'm not into either these days um but yeah it just was an opportunity that I saw that people wanted that and they wanted the new newest thing the more unique thing mm-hmm. so um yeah ended up starting a business which was um you know unique trainers that we could get and customize for for people and um it was mainly students initially and then it grew outside of that um but that did really well and um sort of sparked my interest to continue and and do more when it comes to all your different businesses that you've you've done over the years is there anything that you've really learned that sticks out to you that really helps you today and what you're doing there's certainly a level of resilience that you build you know the more i think very early on in the first businesses you know the roller coaster that you go on where um you know you get an email in the morning which is you know terrible and you're like oh the business isn't going nowhere and then you get a call 10 minutes later yeah. and you're like on top of the world you're gonna have a billion dollar company soon <laughs> uh, and you go through that multiple times a day and um you know after a while you figure out things are never as bad as they they can seem um and also things are uh, can be a lot better than than you think so you know also like how to focus my brain is not the best at focusing and for, and concentrating on things so it's one of those things I had to work on a lot over the years to really get down to work and and, and focus on the right things and I think just over years you, you you kind of figure it out how do you stay resilient in that moment when you have that email that brings you on that low and you have to stay motivated what are the tips and tricks that somebody can utilize in that time yeah for me it's changed over the years so initially that used to be um i used to have a really really good group of other entrepreneurs at a similar stage around me mm-hmm. and people motivated me so as soon as i was having these conversations with other founders and they were going through their journey i was going through mine you share stories, you share that energy, and that always really motivated me. Yeah. Um, when things got tough, I'd just go to the gym because that was kind of like my way to clear my mind, uh, go for a run, go to the gym. That was my kind of thing. These days, I think it's changed a little bit. I think I'm certainly, I've been through many of the downs, so I kind of know that it's okay. It's 
these downs come, you there'll be the days where where things are going up. Yeah. Um, as long as you kind of zoom out and look at the wider picture, there's there's progress. And yeah, certainly the support of of people around me is is always the key motivating factor for me. Certainly. And I think it's an interesting point you made about having that network around you because something that I have heard from a, a lot of entrepreneurs who I've sat and interviewed is that it can be quite lonely when you're the one running your company. Of course, you've got a co-founder, so mm. I'm sure that helps a little bit yep. with with balancing that. Is that something you then you'd advise for a lot of people who are starting out on their own to build a network around themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I think it's finding the right network and finding, you know, everyone calls it this tribe and don't particularly like to use the word, but it, it is trying to find you know, who are the people that you really connect with that you can be open and honest with about your business? Because I find a lot of networking events, people go there and it's just like, hey, everything's great, put a smile on your face. Yeah. And, and that's not so useful a lot of the time, you know, actually um, admitting where your weaknesses are can be, you know, your strength, because that's when people will help you. That's when you'll find the support there that can take you to the next level. And um, if you don't admit that, then you're kind of, and I, I probably fell foul of this many times as well, you know, and I kind of felt like I didn't want their help. It felt like a weakness, right? Yeah. And actually you continue, but you're not progressing as much as you can when you start looking at those weaknesses and how to solve them. Um, so yeah, certainly having a really core kind of little group around you, I think is super useful. I'm very lucky that a lot of my friends are quite entrepreneurial in general. So, you know, we're friends, but we also run businesses and or have that kind of mindset, which um, certainly helps. But even my friends who are not running businesses and things, similar mindset in terms of that wanting to achieve, wanting to do well, um, and just being very open to to talk about things that aren't going so well and, you know, where we can support each other. And when you look at managing a team, how have you gone about doing that? Is that something that you have learned through your network, through other people, or is that just something you've learned over time? Um Learned over time, probably the hard way. Yeah, it's not, it's not easy, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. And um, I don't think myself or George are maybe the most empathetic sometimes and probably weren't the best managers when we first started out in terms of um, looking after our teams. But um, we grew into those kind of leadership roles. And I think we've developed to a point now where we've We've gone through all of those experiences and there's still lots we can do better for sure. But yeah, when it comes to building the team, we know what to look for when we're hiring that team a little bit more than we did. We can't be too closed off in terms of what we want from the team. Um, I think you can be surprised by, you know, people and just finding the right people for the business is important beyond the skills necessarily. Mm -hmm. The skills can be taught, those can come. And, you know, I probably should have trusted my gut a lot more in the past. Um, and I do so now. And I think it, it's essentially a really good indicator. It's really finding the people, especially at the early stage, that are on board with the mission and really care about it. Mm -hmm. If it's just for the salary and the money or, or a payday at the end of it through equity, then you'll find moments where, um, which are harder, where you, they might not get through it or motivation will drop but if there's a mission to it and they're really behind the mission then uh, it's much easier to get through the times which are going to be tough which are inevitable in a startup so definitely yeah yeah and can you talk more about a time when you felt like you should have trusted your gut more yeah for sure I think um we we had a hire which on paper looked ideal for the role um very good um, qualifications, good um, good companies that I'd worked for previously. Um, you know, when it came to the interview, great presentation, proactive, all of this kind of thing. But there was something which was in some of the conversations which I wasn't massively confident about. There were some red flags. Um, and there was someone else who just didn't really have any of the background or the skills but was fantastic in the interviews as a person and felt like this person had the right mindset to go grow into a role and then eventually I think when I had a chat with others in the team we ended up going for the, for the first guy who you know on paper looked great 
Um, and that really did not work out. So, you know, um, very quickly, I think as the more you obviously you work with someone, the more you really find out. And um, uh, the other lady went on to do another role and did did really well. So, um, yeah, it's always like, you know, one thing you look at and get, ah, missed out on a part on, the, on making the right decision there. But mm -hmm. it's a learning experience. We've gone on and mm -hmm. built from that. So that was certainly um, a moment where it just felt... I like should have gone with my gut at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to building a relationship with a co-founder, you're really good to get some advice on what others should look for when working with a co-founder. Me and George met while we were both at Huddle, so working there. So it was more sales engineering side. I was more marketing side. Um, but we ended up running some events together. So some startup events or like, you know, drinks, networking, interviews, this kind of thing. And we ended up, um, sort of, I guess, becoming friends out of that. And we spent a lot more time together. We had ideas. We were both similar in the sense that we had both done um, things at university, you know, our own startups. And, yeah, just kind of we fell into kind of doing this business together. Over the years, you know, we've had our disagreements, which is totally fine. We very early on figured out that, you know, I'm more commercial, he's more technical product side, so we'd own our area so where we didn't agree on things on strategy or whatever it might be if it was commercial related then i'd have 51 percent of the say to his 49 okay. and vice versa for products uh, technical side of things that was really useful just in when you get to to kind of a blocker um on on where to go forward then we trusted each other on those moments you know we we, we had something clear there to say okay it's product, it's your decision. It's commercial, it's my decision. So that was really, really game-changing when we went forward and just made things a lot smoother. I think that's a really interesting way to do it because that is the big thing when it comes to working with co-founders. If you both disagree, where do you go from there? Yeah, and it's uh, it's difficult because, you know, even if you're, you're three co-founders, then you have the thing of, like, is two against one ganging up almost? And if it happens multiple times, then it just feels a little bit... It changes the dynamic again, but if everyone has ownership over certain parts, and it's you know, it's uh, it's kind of like the final say on something when you're you're at that kind of um, point, then it just makes decisions easy. You know, at least people feel okay. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. like a toy cost almost. It's like well, it's spoken, so we go ahead with it. Not every decision is going to be right or wrong, but you know that you've made the right decision in following along with it and you do your best. Tell me a little bit more about certain skills that you've had to develop over time. We talked about resilience. Yeah. But are there any others that really come to mind where you think if you're going to go on this route to starting your own business and growing it, it's really good to have these skills in place? Uh, yeah, loads. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one which is really, um, really, really needed is focus. When you're early on and starting a business, you can get pulled in every single direction mm -hmm. by lots of opportunities. Uh, you end up spending too much time on branding or how your logo looks. You know, it doesn't matter. None of this really matters. Sometimes that can be procrastination as well. It can be, and it, I think yeah. there's there's it's very difficult sometimes to know what to do next because there's so many things. And I I certainly find that writing it down and prioritizing and thinking, okay the end of the day, what do I need right now? It's mm -hmm. to validate and to validate by getting paying customers on board. Um, so is what I'm doing now going to do that? And yes, you can link everything to that. And you can say, well, if my brand looks nicer, then people will see it and that might lead to something. Um, but you have to be really, really harsh on yourself and just say, look, actually, instead of spending time doing this, should I just be going speaking to my potential customer and validating that this is right or or wrong mm -hmm. you know in terms of what our assumptions are because we make so many assumptions and it's trying to um prove that right or wrong that's you know your job in the early days of, of a startup yeah very very much um focus that also comes down to things like your market you can sell something to a very large market and that's what you have to say to investors right there's a big market for this we can grow into but where do you start mm -hmm. if you're if you're starting with that whole market you know your resources are not being maximized um you have limited time you have limited capital how do you put that to best use it's 
choose a tiny niche, focus on that, get something repeatable, really understand it very well, and then you can focus on on growth into other market or extending your 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 reach into that market later. If you know what works in that niche, then you can look at okay, what's a complementary niche which is still in the same market, but yeah. you can replicate what you've learned. You might have to tweak it a little bit, you know, messaging, um, these kind of things, but you know that you've got a sales funnel now that you can replicate. You know what the pain points are. You just need to maybe adapt it a little bit for what the market is. Um, but yeah, certainly it, it's it's a skill which then helps in whatever you're doing, you know, when yeah. it comes to okay, marketing, sales, all of this, yes, you could do everything. And if you go on LinkedIn, there's a million pieces of content now. Every other post is someone telling you advice on what you can do on your marketing or your sales or whatever it might be. Yeah, um, It's just trying to focus and trying to know what's going to, you know, give me the best output because ultimately, you know, it's the 80 20 rule, right? It's 20% of what you work on is going to give you 80% of your output. So what are those big things that you need to work on every day mm -hmm. to get that out? But that's why I think everyone needs to come back to it every morning is just looking at what they're working on and okay, what is the output of this? What's it going to help? What's it going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, how's it going to get me to my next stage and my quarterly goals, my six monthly goals, my year annual goals? Um, so yeah, I think that's that's where focus comes in. I know that you've had a lot of experience in mentorship when you started Incubus and you yourself are a mentor to a lot of other people as well. Tell me a little bit about your experience with mentorship and how important that has been to your businesses. Mentorship is really important. Like anything, there's there's good and bad sides of it. I think one of the key things, let's say, from a mentee's perspective yeah. is being open to listen to advice but also not falling foul to taking in everything and feeling like that is you know gospel and that you have to do that yeah uh because at the end of the day you're the only one with the amount of knowledge the deep understanding of your business um your market your competition everything you've done so far which has been good feedback and testing your business validation all of that kind of stuff goes into it and you have to apply that as context to any advice you get and so taking in that advice and knowing when to pick and choose what is useful it might be none of it it might be all of it um but that's i think super important i think the other thing is when looking for a mentor is mm -hmm. trying to think okay where am i now where do i want to be in a year or two years who's just been on that journey you know yeah. Can I speak to um, another startup, which is in our industry, maybe something complementary, but was where we were two years ago and is now in the place where we want to be, you know, gone on and got more customers, um, build a business. Um, and they can be often the best because, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the mentorship is maybe less strategy, but more process. Um, and certainly some strategy thinking in there, but, um, you know, I think as well, if you do what 99% of the people do, you'll never be in that 1%. And I think if you want to be in that 1%, you kind of have to think sometimes, take advice, fine, but but think for your think for yourself. What would you say is a really good way to approach somebody for mentorship? What are some of the things that you've seen have been really good? And also what are some of the things that you'd say to avoid? Mm -hmm. Being really, 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 really specific. Okay. <laughs> you know, why me? Why, what have i done that you think would be useful for you to learn from um could that be um industry you know i see people going to um to to other mentors just in general like oh you sold a business a few years ago you're really successful i see you all over the place i'd love to be mentored by you and it's like well is that just purely because of you know what you've seen this person's held in high regard up mm -hmm. here rather than could that person actually really help you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for one, are they going to put in the time? Do they care about what you're doing? You know, if you if you see some of the things that I care about, you know, if you follow my LinkedIn or Twitter, things I'm talking about, mm -hmm. then, you know, mention that and say, well, look, I'm doing um, a startup which is focused on reducing waste. And that's something I'm passionate about. So there's a good fit, you know, if you're doing something about, 
um, gaming, then it's not really anything I'm interested in. So, you know, you're you're reaching out to the wrong person there already. So it's trying to find that kind of fit where I'm going to have an interest behind your mission, mm-hmm. but also you're going to be able to get value from what I've done previously. That doesn't have to be what was shown on the front of Forbes magazine. It mm-hmm. can be just like, you know, have a look through my LinkedIn, have a look through whatever it might be. I'm interested to know about anything along your journey that has essentially been a bit of a blocker to your success that you've had to overcome. So it could be knowledge in an industry, it could be mindset. Does anything come to mind that you've had to essentially overcome along your journey? Yeah, lots. I don't think I was, um, you know, let's say, for instance, the industry I'm in now yeah. in commercial real estate wasn't something I've ever thought I'd be in. Um, the opportunity was there and we, you know, myself, my co-founder have a certain skill set and um, that's something we can bring to the industry and we knew that it could make a big difference in the industry. But that's something we had to pick up, you know, if I, to some extent, if I knew what was massively involved in the industry, I probably wouldn't have be, been here doing what I'm doing. Right, okay. You know, um, you know, if you look at some of the buildings we work in, there's very unstructured data. There's a lack of understanding of what assets they have. You know, they barely know what technology is in their own buildings. Um, and it's quite a mess. But that's where we can come in and support. And this is where our expertise in technology and how it can be applied in certain situations can mean that we can provide huge amount of help and be a really useful product for the industry. Um, and the customers that we talk to. But, you know, if I was probably done 10, 15 years in that industry, I'd probably be, like I say, my head's in in that box, in that hole, and I'd probably be like, well, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't. Um, but instead, we'd go into it with a we-can attitude because we're like, well, we've seen this work in banking, seen this work in, re- in retail. You know, the same principles can apply here in real estate and this huge amount of challenges mm-hmm. which are there. And, those challenges we saw when we were building spaces for for um our our, our sort of corporate clients before and um yeah we said well it's got to be an easier way to do this let's start building something to make life easier for us and our existing clients and it grew into well other people want this now and mm-hmm. there's something there let's go really test this out validate it um and we just spent so much time learning about the industry talking to anyone being curious, asking questions, trying to figure out what was the cause of any problem or challenges. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, okay, we had the pandemic kind of hit in the middle of all of this, which yeah. actually was useful in some senses, as in it gave us lots of time to figure out, um, you know, what the challenges were. And they were changing at the time, so everyone was talking about it. Um, there were lots of conversations because people had less to do at the time. So we could have those conversations with our, with our customers um, and they were more willing to, to open up because they didn't have 100 meetings in a day. <laughs> so, yeah, to some senses that was actually quite useful. But, yeah, just really in-depth understanding of who are our customers, what is the problem, what is causing that problem. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, how can our technology help? So, yeah, that was really useful. I think when you start off believing in what can be done, um, probably underestimate a little bit and um, or overestimate in some areas and underestimate in others. And I think it's it's trying to find that balance. And also, you know, there's lots of things that you can do which I think seem impossible Okay. until you start doing it. And can I think... give me an example? So I used to years ago and i probably should get back to doing this actually was i used to send one message or some form of contact to someone i thought was unreachable every week okay so you know i'd be going out to um all sorts of people that i just felt like i'll never be able to talk to them right and in the end loads of people never got back to me but i did get replies and i got them from like billionaires from authors from movie stars like all of these kind of areas which I could never have dreamt of, you know, 
having any contact with. And it would, it would actually be them, not like their publicist. That'd manager. be them. Yeah, and I, you know, there's one time where I reached out to Mark Dixon, who is the founder of Regis, um, and you know, billionaire, huge uh, person in in the industry. And, you know, I reached out to him. Ten minutes later, he had an email saying, my uh, my PA is going to get in contact with you. Let's jump on a call. And then I'm at home. This is during the pandemic. And I was like, oh, I need to find a nice background <laughs> where it's quiet and I can have a have a call. And so, uh, you know, straight away, ten minutes later, um, I'm on a call with him. And, you know, it only lasted ten minutes. That's but insane. he was straight to the point, like, all of this. And I was like, that was an incredible experience. Were you doing that? And more so because you wanted advice or you wanted mentorship? For me, it was to believe that you can do it because, you know, sometimes you look at, you you want to reach out to a CEO of a business that you want to work with. Yeah. And you think, oh, the CEO, they're, you know, they're miles away. They're, they're probably not going to listen to me, all of this stuff. It was just training my brain into realizing that, hey, people will get back and it won't be everyone that I'm going for the top of the top here, you know, and I'm getting responses. Um, so it can be done. Uh, and, um, you know, I also learned, you know, what things would trigger that response. And this is where I mentioned on the mentorship being very specific. The more specific I was, the more, uh, the better responses I got. You know, if it was very specific to something they've done, which relates to me, um, a lot of the time I would just send things like, I read a great book or read a good, good article or I watched something that I really enjoyed and um, I felt something after that and I would just send it to them and go like, hey, um, massively enjoyed your book, this bit in particular, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. just, just so I'd let you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they'd come back and be like, wow, that really means a lot to me, massively appreciate that. I've got a new book on the way, I'm going to send you one. You know? And it's like little things like that which doesn't, you know, or, or even if they just said thanks and didn't send me anything, it was like, didn't add anything to my life. But now I know that I can reach out to them and get the response from that person yeah. who previously felt unreachable. And it's that thing, if you don't ask, you don't know. You could have easily been intimidated by those types of relationships and think, well, okay, I'm never going to, um, there's no point. Like, there's going to be yeah. so many barriers before this message even gets to that person. Yeah. Evidently not in your, in your case. That's it. And it's, it's you know, it, it's, building that's part of the resilience thing in, in as well it's it's building that kind of resilience to say yes i'm not going to get to everyone i want to get mm -hmm. but i will get to a few key people and i can maximize the, the opportunity i get from that or at least i've given it a go and you know unless you unless you go for you know my art teacher back in school always said to me if you aim for a b then that's the most you'll ever get right and most likely you'll get a C. Uh, but if you aim for an A and you fail, then you might get a B. Um, but you might also get that A. And, um, you know, that's always kind of stuck with me as in just aim for as high up as I can. And even if you fall short of that, you're still much further than if you're aiming just, you know, at what you feel you can achieve. You mentioned at the start that this all feeds into this personal philosophy about what might seem impossible isn't actually impossible can actually happen mm -hmm. so does that also translate to your businesses as well when you started in yeah. deep space yeah for sure you know and we'd have conversations with potential clients and it'd be like well we don't have this we don't have that um you know it'd be very difficult to do this but you know we built up that resilience over years we built up that mindset that actually we can we will get through all of these we will figure out a way sometimes you need to get creative and think out of the box but it can be done and a lot of the time the people you're working with, they're also, you have to think about their perspective they're coming from. Okay. This is their job and they earn that job to look after their family and they don't want to do anything that's going to potentially risk it. If things are working okay and getting along, they might not be growing, but maybe there's no incentive in the company for them to be growing up. So you have to kind of use those perspectives and understand where they're coming from when they're saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. That's something we always look at, which is, okay, put ourselves into their position, put ourselves into different people's positions mm -hmm. and understand, okay, how can we then navigate through this to, to get to the outcome we want? Maybe the technology is not there at the moment, but maybe there's a way of almost hacking it together and making it work. And as long as you get the outcome and you're showing the value, then the rest you can clean up and make better and smoother and 
improve on, but you know, same thing with your product. You know, this is why everyone says the MVP was the minimal viable product. It doesn't have to look great. It doesn't have to always work. It doesn't have to, it can be buggy, but as long as you're getting the core piece of value mm-hmm. that someone's willing to go through all of those bugginess and rubbish design and all of this to, to, to kind of get that outcome, then that's when you know you've got something there because you're really validating what the solution is to, to that problem. And that's often better, you know, saying, well, look, actually I've got a bit of a, a rubbish product and mm-hmm. let's just put it out there and see if people still want to use it. Mm-hmm. If they don't, then, you know, maybe your your pull is not strong enough in terms of what you've got as a value value proposition. Can you share with us anything that you are currently facing now, which is a bit of an unknown? Yeah, actually, probably a really interesting one is we have an element of machine learning here within our product. I understand a lot of the tech, but sometimes some things can go over my head, um, especially in the machine learning side of stuff yeah. that we're we're doing more of now so and there's, um, more, there's more coming out every year and, well. and there's so much coming <laughs> up at the moment especially on this this side of things so um yeah i i just started a course with um um capital enterprise who are doing free machine learning courses oh, wow. this is for businesses who want to implement machine learning or are already doing so like we were um and so yeah it's you know i've only just started it a few few um sessions in but really really interesting and it's it's a lot of uh, maths <laughs> wasn't always my strong point but um yeah it's good learning and it's going to help me now as we build on our strategy going forward as we talk to customers when i'm talking with technical teams just to have that extra layer of knowledge even if it's not you know deep deep understanding where i'm going to then you know actually do it myself but it's it gives me enough to, to kind of have those conversations. What is it about you, do you think, that urges you to move forward when you're faced with these challenges? Good question. Um, I've always had this kind of thing towards optimizing my life towards happiness, what I felt as being happiness, right? So um, I think a lot in life we do things which we feel will make other people happy and then in turn that might make us feel happy. But actually when I started reframing everything as this is what's going to benefit my life and through that it will benefit others. Yeah. Um, it just meant that I was always looking at the positives or the potential opportunity, the, that kind of outlook. Even things to work, make my life easier. It can be sometimes quite lazy, but I think that's also helped in terms of trying to make things faster and more efficient in that mm-hmm. perspective. Now, currently, every day I'm doing outreach to these kind of people in the sector and I'm coming across the same challenges you know, too many people in in the sales cycle, small budgets, all of this. So why am I looking at this sector? Maybe there's another area we didn't consider. I'm looking at that sector because I've got the network already. I've got um, some understanding of it, but I shouldn't be afraid to go somewhere else mm-hmm. and build that network and build that understanding because, you know, maybe there isn't that competition. Maybe there isn't that length of sales cycle because people are more... Um, open to opportunities in that sector, whatever it might be. So selfishly, I'm trying to look at ways to make my life easier. So every day, I'm not getting rejections or challenges or, or things which are going to slow me down. But instead, I'm looking for things which are going to be much easier to sell to, to support and and, and build on. Um, and this this happens in every part of my life. So whether that's like, okay, cooking dinner or you know whatever it might be, you know, just general personal stuff. It's um, it's always looking at ways to optimize my life towards something which is happier. If something I do every day is not making me happy or it's it's like frustrating, it's, you know, whatever it might be, then I will look at ways to get rid of it. And it seems like it's quite a conscious thought as well, because sometimes it's very easy just to sort of go along with the flow and not be as aware of where you're spending your time. Mm. You seem to not get into those patterns. It took a long term of learning that and... Um, you, you you know making those mistakes uh, but but I got to a point where I was like you know you hear people talking about what they want to do and you don't see any progress towards it or people complaining about things and the more I heard that the more I looked for it in myself because I, I saw it as a very negative trait or or something which I was like well just go do it if you want to do it go yeah. figure out a way to do it you know why are you out drinking with me here 
when you you know sometimes you need to sacrifice things to go if you really want something you tell me every time you want this um go 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 find a way of making that happen so um you know i i looked at that in myself as well and said okay do i need to go for another dinner this week and just catch up with the same people you know this is just general conversation nothing amazingly new or could i spend that time doing something a bit more productive um and relationships are still super key to me and building those and ensuring to have long-term kind of relationships um with the right people yeah that's something that i thought well you know if i'm more efficient and i'm more focused and also when i'm with people then i know that i can compartmentalize a little bit and say okay i'm done with work now i've just got this day off to go spend with friends and family or my girlfriend whatever it might be for those people who want to learn more about you your journey where can they find you on socials probably best just to connect with me on linkedin so yeah that's probably the best way to to stay in touch thank you so much for coming today not at all thank you for having me i appreciate it it was really fun